the truth is always the same. Reality, that absolute reality is always there. It's always the same and people will find it in whatever way they seek it out. Mm. They will find it, but they will call it by different names. Mm. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Soul Sessions with Creative Mind. I'm Deborah Burt Maldonado here with Dr. Rob Maldonado. Good to be here. And we are continuing our series on Jung and yoga and how they merge together, East versus West. But before we begin our topic today, I wanted to remind you to subscribe to our podcast, either through Spotify, iTunes, or anywhere you're listening to our podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, there's a little button in the corner of this video. Please click subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Uh, we are continuing our series on Young and Yoga. Yes, la yesterday, last week, we yeah. talked about the ego. Yeah, that was an interesting um, concept to compare how Jung saw the ego and how it's conceived of in yoga philosophy. And so this episode is, we're going to go deeper. We're going to go beyond the ego to the part of us that we can't see directly, uh, how to realize the power of the collective unconscious. And we're going to talk about the unconscious mind in Jung and yoga, but most specifically the collective unconscious. Yeah. Yeah. So be, everyone has heard of the unconscious mind, uh, mm. but often it's uh, understood to mean the personal unconscious, what Jung called the personal unconscious. What that means is that it's seen as a collection of all your past experiences, uh, the things that you've repressed into your personal unconscious, uh, the things you've forgotten, mm. you've learned and forgotten, but are still in there. That's the personal unconscious. So when you tie your, sh you learn how to tie your shoes, it stores into the template and you don't have to pull up. The, the program pulls up for you when you yeah. drive a car, ride a bike, all these things are automatic. And then everything about our personality basically is on autopilot. Very much so. And it's an important part, of course, in, in psychoanalysis, uh, Freud's idea and then Jung's idea uh, of uh, anal analytical psychology. Easy for me to say. <laughs> uh, you have this idea of, yeah, you have to start with the personal unconscious because it's it is replete with all of these complexes and mm. hang ups and uh, kind of stuff that we haven't dealt with mm -hmm. in the personal unconscious. But Jung had this incredible idea because he was looking to match what the ancient spiritual practices were doing throughout time, which was take an individual through a spiritual transformation. Mm. So he came up with this idea of the collective unconscious. So a deeper layer to the unconscious. A much deeper layer to the unconscious mind. And he got the idea from a dream, mm -hmm. a dream he had. And the dream was he was had a dream he was in a house and then he realized, oh, this is my house. We, and I think a lot of people have had this dream where you're going and then you're realizing there's all these other different rooms. And so he started exploring and he was kind of curious and excited. And he kept opening doors and seeing what's inside. And he said that, you know, the, the first level was kind of dark and, you know, had the same furniture from his era. But then he opened this door and he saw this spiral staircase that went down into below and so he started exploring and the deeper he went he kept going to layer upon layer of this these basements of this house and the first layer was a roman time um antiquities and then we go down deeper into uh more early man times and then kept going deeper and deeper to like the origins of man and he said wow this is really incredible that there's mm. this all these layers and and then why do i have access to that and then human beings must have access and that's what he started seeing in in different cultures uh they all kind of had the same themes and same uh rituals and uh the same way they look at things and humanity has this like collective ness to it that it's just we're not isolated and learning everything in this life that there's a, a more of a universal part of ourselves that's connected to the history of man yeah absolutely so he found essentially the key to a lot of what was going on in ancient spiritual traditions and certainly in yoga philosophy 
in that he found the reservoir of creativity, of religious symbols, of mm. spiritual inspiration, uh, of even art, because art used to be tied very much to spiritual traditions in that the artist was inspired by the divine mm. to create these powerful symbols, mm. amulets and, and religious symbolism that inspired people and guided people throughout their lives. Um, so in essence, we're talking about the realm of the gods. Mm. And, and Jung's uh, psychology definitely opened up those kind of studies, comparative religion, comparative mythologies, um, understanding of culture and ritual in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. So when talking about the realms of the gods in, in all traditions, both Eastern and Western, um, we see that he's, he's getting at something very different than, than just the, the personal unconscious. Just the conditioning and yes. the complexes of my mo mother complex or father complex. That's right. He's getting at this deeper layer of existence mm. that uh, spiritual traditions have always talked about. Mm. But his idea was that we've lost it in modern societies because mm. we live so much on the surface and the paradigm that has been adopted by Western technological society has been one of materialism. Mm -hmm. That whole idea of this rich uh, reservoir of inspiration, uh, spirituality, uh, art, and science has been forgotten, essentially. Mm. It's been relegated to superstition. Or well, I think in a way, sometimes, don't you think that it's captured in movies and the, you know, the superhero movies and the, the mythologies like a Game of Thrones or, um, you know, these uh, Lord of the Rings and mm. these kind of with all these archetypes. And there's always the hero and the victim and the, the heroine and uh, the wise one, you know, all these very similar characters that keep recurring. And then if you look at our life, even in the waking world, there's these same characters are playing out it's almost like we have this um uh template that we we live out all the time yeah. unconsciously yeah and, and so young definitely believed that through that the individual through peering inward through mm. the this individuation process that he talks about this kind of self transformation was able to access the collective unconscious mm -hmm. in other words it wasn't something that you could only study academically. Mm. It was or and is a part of our psyche. That through dreams, like like he, his own dream, right, mm. of the house, you could experience that deeper part of yourself. And I've had, you know, everyone can relate to dreams in their life, these big dreams, and you wonder what it really means. Like what it like there's a part of me that's trying to speak with me yeah. in a very metaphorical way that it just has this like numinous quality, this floating quality. And we all have those mystical moments and then we wake up and think, oh, that was just <laughs> because I watched that show and I'm pulling in those characters or uh, but it really is this um, this idea that we're connected to this deeper intelligence and that intelligence is speaking to us in dreams and in the uh, world and if we live this symbolic life yes uh, and of course the the central concept that helps us understand the collective unconscious is the idea of the archetype mm. and a lot of people have trouble understanding the archetype precisely because they're at the personal level they want to yeah. understand it at what does that mean to, for me mm. so anything that means something to you particularly that's part of the collect. I'm um, sorry. That's part of the personal unconscious. Mm. It has to do with your personal history and interpretation. So, for example, if you're play the, like the victim uh, archetype, you but you're basically identifying with that role as a personal from your personal experience. It's not really the archetype. I mean, it's not your. It's not really. It's more of the ego. Very much taking so. Taking it. But the the collective uh, the collective nature of the archetype, the universal nature of the archetype, is precisely that that it's pointing to the collective layer of the psyche, not the personal. Mm. And then if we okay, we ask if if these are if this is the realm of the gods, 
In Western traditions, we know the Greeks uh, had this incredible pantheon of gods, mm -hmm. Mount Olympus, uh, Athena and Apollo, and all of these incredible gods that they represented aspects of the psyche, mm -hmm. but the, 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 not the personal unconscious, but the deeper layer, the collective unconscious. Right, so you you have gods of fertility, you have gods of thunder, gods of the ocean, god of war. God In other of words, love. these are archetypal images, mm. ideas, patterns. That that's the usefulness of Jung's work is that it allows us to keep the understanding of those traditions in a psychological way. So it's almost like, in a personal level, we think about our memories of things that happen to us and why we do certain things, where the archetypes on the collective level are really that collective uh, patterns of being in humanity, mm. that we're, we're, we're uh, seeing our patterns, basically, on a collective level, which is a lot more um, profound. And even, like, I was raised Catholic. Um, we prayed to the saints. There was a saint for every, uh, you know, for marriage, or there's a saint for for abundance there's a saint for when you're sick and so it, it's sort of they borrowed that idea right from the gods and, and yeah. uh, the celtic uh and the, those religions that prayed to the different gods the many gods um that all came from now they call them saints so it's the old just, and the new gods the old and the new gods <laughs> but they, you, but you see those patterns that they have these like greater responsibilities mm. these greater human needs Versus just little personality traits. These are like forces of the universe and forces of the psyche. That's right. That, that's clo as close as we can get to kind of a definition of an archetype. Like a force. It's a, like you said, it's a universal force. Mm. That's uh, it, what universal means that it's, it applies to all of us. So can everyone. You, so for a person, they could either um, unconsciously take on the archetype as a mm. role and then make it inflated like they're the god or they're the the grand hero <laughs> or they can choose the archetype consciously and not have the ego attached to it and actually use the true force of that archetype absolutely but we'll leave that for another podcast <laughs> now let's say the trinity which you mentioned catholicism mm. i'm glad you mentioned that because i always have to mention catholicism we know the the concept of the Trinity is a is a big part of uh, Catholicism, right? Or and Christianity in general. In yoga philosophy, or let's say in the in in the Indic uh, older philosophy of the Vedas, there's a similar idea of a Trinity. You have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, mm. all representing one aspect of one divine force. Mm. Brahman, absolute consciousness. So Brahma, Brahma, not to be confused with Brahman, uh, Brahma is the creator God, Vishnu is the sustainer, and Shiva is the destroyer. In other words, the cycle of life. So there's there's a sustainer that kind of keeps everything. Well, there's a creator for us. Yeah, lot. but the, there needs to be like the balance between creative and destruction, that sustainer, yeah. or else everything would be destroyed. There has to be some element of uh, holding everything together. Holding everything together. So, uh, in Christianity, what is it? I mean, what 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 is, what's the Trinity? The Father in heaven, the Mother, and the Holy Spirit. No, I think it's the Father. The oh, the Son. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, I haven't been to church in a while. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Th that's right. Mary that's doesn't get a role in the Trinity, although we know she's very important to this whole scenario. Well, you could you could say that the spirit, right, the Holy Ghost, is kind of the feminine principle. Yeah. but you know that's another that, that's another podcast. Let's talk about comparative <laughs> religion here. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this idea of Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva is, is an interesting one, which kind of leads us into that idea of what are these archetypes talking about? Mm. Well, creation, of course, is the creative God, very, mm. very similar to the way uh, Yahweh is expressed in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He's the creator, right? Mm. But he also intervenes in human culture and history, which is the sustainer. Mm. So he's kind of taken on all these roles. But he also and takes on the destroyer. He's also the destroyer. That's mm. right. He, like he punishes down, the wicked. <laughs> uh, 
uh, brimstone and fire on cities. Sodom and Gomorrah. Which is uh, the destructive power yeah. of the divine force. Yeah. So you see these archetypal forces, elements, playing throughout history in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. The Upanishads say one incredible thing that always holds true. The truth is always the same. Reality, that absolute reality is always there. It's always the same and people will find it in whatever way they seek it out. Mm. They will find it, but they will call it by different names. Mm. So it says... The truth is one. The truth is one, but the wise call it by many, many names. I call it by many names. I call Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the idea of the collective unconscious, the realm of the gods... How does that serve us to understand these things? So the, the idea of uh, this collective unconscious, mm -hmm. what in yoga philosophy or, or the philosophy of the Upanishads would be called the universal form of Brahman. Mm -hmm. It serves us because it gives us a, uh, as human beings, it gives us an understanding of what is it that we're dealing with when we're dealing with the world, mm. with our mind, mm -hmm. with what we call reality and unreality. So it defines all those things for us. If we don't have an understanding of what is it that we're experiencing when we're experiencing our own awareness of things, then we start to believe that the appearance of things, meaning the apparent reality, the, the illusion of reality uh, is real. Mm. And that's the mistake that the ego makes. You know, it's interesting, too, in Jung's psychology, he, you know, you're, what you're saying is I th what we're not conscious of is actually more real than what we're conscious of. Well, it, it becomes for us important and real because if we're not conscious of it, we think... We project it uh, yeah. onto the world, Me, yeah. and we think don't have control of what I experienced in the past, uh, and what I started to believe about myself and the world from my past experience is what I now know as real, hmm. and we don't ever question it. And so, the limitations of our life, uh, the way we bump up against uh, obstacles, mm -hmm. we start to think they're coming from. The outside mm -hmm. is I don't have anything to do with this. I can't, I'm helpless against this because they're external to me. And that's the illusion mm -hmm. that we fall into. So if we don't understand the nature of reality, how it's constructed, maintained and destroyed, then we're lost. We're caught up in our personal experience, our personal bubble of conditioning. Well, what I was going to get to is that Jung had said, that actually our shadow is closer to our true, true self than our persona. Have mm. you heard that before? So it's like this, uh, what, what's true about us is, is not always apparent in the, in the waking world, our truth. That's true. In, the, in that sense, yeah, that, that the mental or what we consider mental is closer to reality than what we consider material out mm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like our imagination is more real than what we pick up with our senses. Yes. Yes. And then and we'll have to do another, uh, another podcast <laughs> on that I'm leading into other subjects. <laughs> <laughs> so the vision that, and this is from the Gita, Arjuna asked Krishna to show him, you know, show me this, this collective unconscious. And this is in the Gita. This is in the Gita in, in chapter 11. Uh, in, in essence, he's asking to see the evidence, right? Like a lot of our students mm -hmm. want to want to see it, mm -hmm. right? They, they want to see it. So Krishna, representing the higher self here, or the, or the divine, the divine element, he's actually considered a, an avatar of Vishnu. So Krishna uh, uh, consents to showing Arjuna, his pupil, his universal form. Doesn't he warn him a little bit first? Are you sure you <laughs> want to see this? Yeah, there's a warning to this. Yeah. So Arjuna said, once he sees it, right? He says, my dear Lord Krishna, I see assembled together in your body all the demigods and various other living entities. 
I see Brahma sitting on the lotus flower as well as Lord Shiva and many sages and divine serpents. Mm. O Lord of the universe, I see in your universal body many, many forms, bellies, mouths, eyes extended without limit. There is no end, there is no beginning, and there is no middle to all of this. Wow. And of course it goes on and... and uh, Arjuna becomes frightened. He starts to tremble. It's overwhelming. To it's him. overwhelming because it is a vision of the totality of the universal self, mm. which is what Jung was referring to as the collective unconscious. It mm. contains all the potentiality of the universe in seed form. And so the darkness and the light. Both mm. uh, the creative power, the sustaining power, and the destructive power. Hmm. Yes. And so when we think about our life and we think, um, I know when I first started doing spiritual work, I wanted to get rid of all the negative, mean uh, people in the world and I wanted to change the evil and <laughs> fight evil. But we have to understand that what we're seeing always is a reflection of our own psyche. Like we're all one. Like you can't separate and say there's good people over here and then we're going to slice up this universal mm. self with good and bad. Right. Uh, there are, it's like more of a melding of all of them all together. Is, and that's what that vision showed. And so how can we look at our lives in, in a real way, understanding this knowledge? How could someone apply this? In their life like today like when you're looking at yourself and even i know for me working on just on the personal unconscious and working on those smaller things that we're trying to uh, heal in our life um to accept the dark and light of ourselves even on a personal level and then that prepares us to accept all the greater parts of ourselves yeah because uh uh let's say what is the process that jungian psychology is talking about he's talking about individuation a process of transcending our persona. The ego. Right? He's not saying push it away, deny it. He's saying understand that what you created as your personality, there's nothing wrong with it, but that it's a stage of development that you're meant to transcend mm. through higher learning. It's like first grade <laughs> or grammar school, yes. and then you go into... Yes. You know, your master's and PhD in life. How does that compare to the process that yoga takes one through? In Patanjali's yoga, the idea is also an, a, a transcendence of the ego, mm. right? Because the ego is conditioned by its karmic imprints. Mm. It's, it's bound to its previous actions and learning. Mm -hmm. And it's bound, essentially. It's, it's, uh, it's caught in a in a bubble of delusion that it believes that is who I am and that is what reality is based on its past karmic imprints. And the reality is very different, as we've seen here, that there is this deeper collective unconscious, this deeper cosmic consciousness, if you will, from uh, the yogic uh, Vedantic perspective, that is the ultimate reality. And that reality cannot be perceived and experienced unless we transcend our ego. Mm. Not push it away, not deny it, but work through it to expand our awareness, our consciousness, to where we're able to perceive the deeper truth of what is awareness, what is consciousness. Well, it, in simple terms, the self or the, the ego self uh, sees everything as separate sees it's a me and a mm -hmm. you and that my my home is separate from me there's no connection really it's uh everything's material and and uh, ex looking externally you know let's let's change what we can see and move the furniture around so we can have a better life and that's what the ego is and then what it needs is always feels like it's outside of itself and so when we start to transcend the ego and and we can really access these uh, universal powers mm. that we've been promised that we have this potential, I think a really good exercise for me is helped is to just meditate 
and think about your life and, and see, like just sit in the room and just start to connect and seeing this room is me. This, the, um, the, all the, the trees outside, the sun is me. And like everywhere you go, you start to see that everything is you and it starts to really uh, change your perception of yourself. And uh, that I think will awaken those dreams and take you deeper on that path of individuation. But you'll notice when your mind projects your an ego and it, and it feels caught up in the world. And then you can, if you're connected to everything, and there's nothing in the way of you getting what you want. There's nothing stopping you. Then you don't need anyone's permission to create a life that you want. That's a good point. And there's nothing to fear, nothing to lose because you're everything. So there's nothing to lose and there's nothing to gain. And that's really what uh, Eastern philosophy is preparing us for with non-attachment, with uh, meditation and all these uh, techniques they teach us in the Eastern philosophy, as well as the shadow work and Jungian psychology, you're starting that path of seeing I'm not the ego. That's like the yeah. core teaching of it. East and West is I am not the ego. Yeah, all traditions throughout the past, and including uh, current uh, psychological understanding, has always emphasized that it is a process. In other words, it's a transformative process that begins with insight but cannot stop at insight mm -hmm. so the insight is necessary you have to understand okay what what have i been doing and what is the nature of reality and the mind but then you have to actually let go of your ego which is that transformative aspect the actual letting go is what's difficult for us as mm -hmm. human beings because we're so caught up by our need to survive and to fit in socially and accomplish things in life and get acknowledgement from others yeah, yeah. but it's doable uh, it requires study practice and a good guide a good teacher but it's definitely doable mm -hmm. and it's necessary because if you look at the world its current state the reason it's in such a state is because it's being run by ego minds mm -hmm. or ego possessed ignorant minds. ignorance of the of the universal self because we wouldn't go to war if we realized we're fighting ourselves that's right and then uh, what i've learned even just working with the shadow uh most of the conflicts i had in the world and with other people have been conflicts within myself yeah. and when you start to kind of uh, integrate these the outer and inner to oh it's one it's not a separation it, it gives you all your power back. And uh, and then you could start to really make change in the world. We always say that people that should do your shadow work before you try to make big social changes because otherwise you're just projecting your own personal ego's agenda and mm. seeing that separateness, seeing there's something to fight for, you know, and, and so making a war against something versus let me understand this on a deeper level and then I'll really know the solution. That's right. So, so next time we're going to talk about the self, the true self, mm -hmm. uh, or both the, the way Jung saw the self and the way it's uh, conceived of in the Upanishads, in yoga philosophy. So in the meantime, do that meditation or even in, in life, just start asking, your, start noticing how your mind sees everything as separate and see if you could say, this is me. Oh, that's me. That's a part of me. Not you, the ego, but part of your greater self. Like this is I'm one with everything. And uh, notice how your mind resists. Of course, we want to be one with the light and the glory, but we don't want to be one with the parts that we find uh, uh, unappealing. And that's the challenge, is to have like the vision of the dark and the light and accept all of that as part of creation. So um, have a great rest of your day. Hope you enjoyed the Soul Sessions. And don't forget to subscribe. Again, uh, click on the subscribe button on your podcast on either uh, Spotify or iTunes or any other podcast service you're listening to. And if you're watching us here on YouTube, click the button here and get mm -hmm. to subscribe to our channel. See and you next time. Take care.